Welcome to Invisible Heat. I am Sadia Khan. And I'm Asad Bhatt. And our today's story takes us to Isla Vista, California in May of 2014. 22-year-old Elliot Roger drives his black BMW through the streets of Isla Vista. This is no ordinary night for Roger. Today is what he calls the Day of Retribution. On this day, Elliot will punish humanity, beginning with the women of Santa Barbara City College Alpha Phi sorority. In his car, three semi-automatic weapons, two knives, and over 400 rounds of ammunition. Arriving at the sorority, Roger takes his first round of shots, fatally injuring two women. Unfortunately, This is just the beginning. Eight minutes and 55 shots later, seven people lay dead, their lives tragically cut short. One of them is Roger. This is Invisible Heat. Welcome back to Invisible Heat, a weekly true crime podcast in which Asad and I attempt to uncover the ugly truths behind various hate crimes, both recent and historical. Yeah, that's right. For many of our regular listeners, you'll know that many of the cases that we discuss involve crimes committed against minority groups. And our goal, as always, is to determine through a discussion of the nuances and the complexities of these uh, situations, whether or not they can be considered hate crimes. So, Sadia, before we get to the case, how was your week? Well, I already know how your week was because you got to meet me. Yes, I did, Asad. Although, come to think of it, I don't feel like we met. No? Is that weird? Well, you were kind of my Uber driver, really, because you just drove me from one location to the other. (laughs) That's exactly (laughs) what I was thinking. You know, I was hoping we would sit down, have coffee together, chat about stuff, and then I just drive you from New York City to Greenwich, and that's it. For those of you who uh, want to know, I got completely lost in the grid of New York City and I was half an hour 45 minutes late to our meeting and so I yeah missed out on our little lunch uh, that we were supposed to have our coffee uh, but instead Sadia drove me an hour from New York to a train station in Greenwich Connecticut it was pretty pretty funny but it was a great conversation Sadia it was so nice it was the first time we met in person right? Yeah, it was great conversation. We were able to spill some tea. You were shorter than I thought you were going to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I am not tall. So yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, uh, we've known each other, what, for like two years now and for us to finally Almost meet. Almost two years. Yeah, yes. right. Like it's yes. been, it was really nice. And, and I think that, uh, yeah, it was fun. We spilled some tea, which was a lot of fun. Oh, we, we did? caught up. Yeah, we did. We were talking shit about some people. Oh, um, oh, spill like not literally spilled tea. No, <laughs> no. You are you teaching me an English uh, <laughs> colloquialism? I guess. So basically, that's what we did. Yeah. In Urdu, they call it gupshap, I think, right? Gupshap. We did some gupshap. And yeah, I mean, next time when you come to New York, I would like us to have either lunch or dinner, maybe at least coffee together. Yeah, I think that's right. That would be fun. So how was your New York trip, though? Oh, it was amazing. As I mentioned uh, to um, people last week, you know, we were shooting um, a movie and it was amazing. You know, it was a two day movie shoot and uh, went really well. It was in Brooklyn, New York and everything that could go right went right and so yeah it was really exciting and new york is just always a fun city to visit even though i do tend to get lost and man those trains like express local i I just get so confused all of a sudden you're like 10 stops later than you're supposed to be but yeah great great food and an amazing time yeah but still it's the best city in the world (laughs) i don't know if that's true but i understand why people feel that way for sure so i said should we get back to the case yeah so sadia this case is gonna be a rough one i think but let's get into it yeah yeah and this is our first case in which we talk about hate crime perpetrated based on gender Mm. so yeah let's get started It's the night of May 23rd, 2014. 
22-year-old Elliot Roger sits in his apartment, making his final preparations. Today is Roger's day of retribution, the day he will seek revenge against humanity. At the age of 22, Roger remains a virgin. For years, he's been ignored by women, leaving him sexually frustrated and lonely. Roger blames women and sexually active men for his suffering. He is jealous of every man with a girlfriend, angry with those that have what he doesn't, and enraged with the female population for choosing them over him. And now he thinks it's time for them to pay. Three boys soon enter the apartment, Roger's two roommates and their friend. One by one, as each man enters, Roger ambushes them, attacking each with a knife and stabbing them to death. Oh my goodness. According to the Los Angeles Times, he stabs one a total of 94 wow. times. Another 15 times. Oh my goodness. And the third one, 25 times. None of the men survive. He then leaves the apartment, abandoning his deceased victims. And then at about 7.30 p.m., as if nothing has happened, Roger goes to Starbucks and orders a drink. Oh my goodness. After killing three people, his friends, right? Or his roommates, at least. He goes to a Starbucks as if nothing happened. I mean, that's wild. By the way, there he uploads a video called Elliot Rogers Retribution. To his YouTube page. Mm. He then emails a 137 page manifesto entitled My Twisted World The Story of Elliot Roger oh to his parents, therapist, and several others. Wow. In both sources, Roger essentially declares war on guess who? Women. Yeah. Makes sense. Does it make sense? No, as no, a- it makes sense based on how you described him. I should be clear on that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he writes, and I quote, I cannot kill every single female on earth, but I can deliver a devastating blow that will shake all of them to the core of their wicked hearts. Just crazy that he has this much hatred inside of him and that he can write 137 pages of essentially hate and especially towards women. I mean, for him to be feeling this way and manifesting his hate this way is just it's disgusting it is disgusting asad but who writes 137 pages and he definitely wants to harm women he wants to attack them and he starts by attacking members of the alpha phi sorority deemed the hottest women at santa barbara city college We'll dig further into the contents of these sources in a little bit, but for now, let's return to the story. At around 9.20 p.m., Roger arrives at the Alpha Phi sorority house. So this is about a couple hours after he's murdered his roommates. He's gone to Starbucks. He's uploaded the video, emailed the manifesto. So about two hours after that, now he's going to the sorority. Right. He comes prepared with three semi-automatic weapons, two knives, and over 400 rounds of ammunition. Unbelievable. He exits the car, approaches the house, and begins aggressively pounding on the door. No response. After several minutes of knocking with no luck, Roger returns to his car. He soon spots 22-year-old Catherine Cooper and 19-year-old Veronica Weiss walking past the western wall of the house. The two women belong to a different sorority, but Roger doesn't care. Without hesitation, he raises his gun and begins shooting, striking both women to the ground. He then turns and shoots a third woman walking by before speeding wow. away. I mean, it's clear, like, he just hates all women. And so any female that's walking past, he's targeting. And it's just brutal that just these women are in the wrong place at the wrong time, right? Exactly. He doesn't care. He just wants to harm, inflict pain on women. That's his motive. 
All three women lay sprawled across the grass. Inside the house, someone calls 911. Conversing over the police scanner, officers jump into action. Here's a clip of police scanner communication. Take a listen. Shots fired, shots fired. So, tragically overcome by their injuries, Cooper and Weiss do not survive the attack. The third woman thankfully survives despite suffering multiple gunshot wounds. Roger drives recklessly through the streets in search of his next target. He takes several shots out the window as he drives, haphazardly taking aim at random passerby. That's crazy sadia like I, I think drive-by shootings like this where people are just randomly shooting at the window are just so scary because like you know <laughs> i walk all the time right like we, everybody walks all the time and for I, I don't know if i told you this sadia but there was a at some point a couple of years ago around 11 o'clock at night uh, there was a drive-by shooting by my house <laughs> someone oh my gosh was driving down the street and shot at a tree across the street for me and i was actually up and i heard it and i thought you know you don't think it could ever be a gunshot I don't, I don't even know if i could figure out what a gunshot you know in real life sounds like i thought it was like a car backfiring or something like that until later on my neighbors were all like did you guys hear that and they saw the bullet holes in the tree it's just so crazy and it is scary i said it is so scary Going back to the case, two blocks over from the sorority house, he spots a group of college students standing outside a deli mart. He gets out of the car and approaches the store. Sensing danger, the group takes cover inside the deli, but not before Roger fatally shoots 20-year-old Christopher Michaels Martinez in the chest. According to an ABC News interview with an eyewitness, Roger looks Martinez straight in the eyes, smirking as he shoots him. Wow. So villainous. He immediately crumbles to the ground, his young life tragically stolen from him. Exiting the deli, Roger gets back in his car and continues his violent shooting spree, hitting and wounding several individuals. In the midst of his violent rage, he also strikes several people with his car. So at this point, Asit, he doesn't care anymore. Yeah. You know, he is hitting and killing, shooting every person that he sees. A few minutes into the shooting, Roger comes in contact with four officers. He takes several shots, even at the officers, mm. but not before one of them manages to shoot him once in the hip. He then speeds away once more. As Roger drives away, he accelerates, striking a cyclist. The cyclist smashes into the windshield of the BMW and Roger collides with several parked cars, coming to a stop. Before long, several deputies have moved in on the car, ready to apprehend the shooter. That is Roger. The deputies open the door and pull Roger out of the car to handcuff him only to find him dead, a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. In his wake, Roger leaves six dead and 14 injured, an absolute tragedy. Yeah, so yeah, this is just a horrific story of clearly someone who is angry at the world and taking it out on Anybody and everybody that came in his path, he was determined to kill. And it's it's sad, you know, I mean, in such a short amount of time, he was able to kill six people, injure 14 people. And he was only 22, I said. It is so sad, right? Because he's dead, too. Oh, of course, he's dead, too. And I wish that you could reach out to him and say, look, life gets better. Like, yeah, maybe your life sucks at 22. But like, there's so much more that life has to offer. It's really tragic. Sadia, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back. I want to hear more about Elliot Roger himself and maybe some of the victims as well. Welcome back to Invisible Hate. So Sadia, can you tell us a little bit more about Elliot Roger? Like, how did he get to this point? Absolutely, Asad. Roger had been troubled for quite some time. 
Born in London, England, he moved to the United States with his parents at the age of five. He was raised in Los Angeles where his father, Peter Roger, worked as a screenplay writer and film director. Mm. His mother, Lee Chin Roger, worked as a research assistant for a film company. Roger was half English and half Malaysian. His father from England and his mother from Malaysia. He had one younger sister. According to the New York Times, Roger was emotionally disturbed from a young age. When he was in first grade, his parents divorced. This seems to have had a significant impact on him mm. in a negative way. Roger had been seeing therapists and receiving psychiatric treatment since the age of eight, Asad, for a variety of struggles. When he was seven years old, he was diagnosed with a high-functioning form of Asperger syndrome. For our listeners, Asad, can you explain what that is? Yeah, I believe Asperger's is just, it's part of the autism spectrum, and I think it's more of a high-functioning form of uh, people with autism. Exactly, Asad. People who have Asperger have obsession tendencies, they have odd speech patterns, limited facial expressions, and other atypical mannerisms. Growing up, Roger had consistent trouble making friends and faced several repeated instances of bullying at school. According to a New York Times interview with former high school classmate Patrick Connors, many students treated Roger as an oddball, constantly mocking him and playing jokes on him. And this is so sad, Asad, right? Once in high school, when Roger fell asleep in class, you know what classmates did to him? They taped his head to his desk. Oh, so you know, high school kids can be so horrible. So absolutely horrible. You're right. It is so horrific to imagine that kids could do that to some other kid, right? To make matters worse, Roger's seeing to have struggled romantically and sexually as well, although he was only 22. In both his manifesto and his final YouTube video, he discusses the constant rejection that he faced from girls. Mm. He complains of being 22 years old and still a virgin, a fact that appeared to frustrate him endlessly, which to me is... Not strange, but at 22, why would it bother him so much? I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people in their 20s that are still virgins. And yeah, maybe it's just the way that society portrays movies, culture that you shouldn't be at that point. Right. And that's a great point. Asad. Right. And so perhaps that's what he was dealing with. Roger basically used his personal YouTube account and online blog as a means of expressing these frustrations. These agitations only appeared to grow over time, particularly after he began attending college at Santa Barbara City College. So that was his college too. Roger soon began to act on some of his jealousies and frustrations. In a series of minor incidents, he threw several drinks on happy couples and groups of people he was jealous mm. of. In July of 2013, he attended a college party where he attempted to interact with several girls. When the girls ignored Roger, he tried to push them off a 10-foot Ledge. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. So you can see tendencies, aggressive tendencies. Impulsive reactions. Yeah, for sure. Short temper, yeah. impulsive reaction, obsessive nature. He failed, however, and was instead pushed off the ledge himself by a group of men. Oh, my goodness. Oh, God. Again, this is so sad. I said, why would they do the same thing to him? College guys can be rough. Brutal, yeah. And when he returned to the party to retrieve his sunglasses, Roger was beaten up by the same group of men. So they didn't stop there. Right, right. Police officers dismissed his reports of the incident after learning that he may have been the initial aggressor. According to his manifesto, this was the moment 
in which Roger decided to seek his revenge against humanity, especially women. You know, it's interesting. I, obviously, I think he's at fault here, and clearly people at the party that pushed him and beat him up as well are at fault as well. It's it's a very complex situation. It's sad that, you know, his reaction was that he wanted to then take revenge on, you know, as you describe humanity. So I guess the question is, is this like, was it pre-planned then? It seems like it was based on, on the manifesto. Yes. In fact, Roger spent over a year planning his attack on the Isla Vista wow. community. According to the Los Angeles Times, he spent nearly 2500 purchasing guns and ammunition from several stores in California. In January of 2014, just a few months before the attack, Roger began visiting gun ranges in an attempt to work on his shooting accuracy. And I wonder, Asad, nobody noticed, hmm. nobody knew what he was doing. Maybe this is not unusual behavior, right? Like, yeah. I'm not in gun culture whatsoever, but... I don't know how much a gun costs, but I guess spending $2,500 on guns and ammunition doesn't necessarily seem like a lot to me. I, I sadly have no clue how much a gun costs. Uh, maybe 100 bucks, 500 bucks. I don't either, but you're right. Maybe this was not a red flag. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem like, based on American culture, that this is anything suspicious. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, he had actually intended on carrying out his planned attack earlier but cancelled twice, pushing it off to a further date. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder if, uh, what the reason was. Was it because of realizing that it was something bad or whether it was logistic issues that he was dealing with? Was anybody aware of his plan and did people notice any sort of change in his behavior at the time? So, they so I said there were a few people who really started to take note of Roger's odd behavior in the weeks leading up to his violent rampage. It seems that Roger's YouTube videos had become increasingly disturbing, leaving his parents incredibly concerned. And I wonder how his parents found out about his YouTube videos, mm, right? Yeah, Unless right. they were monitoring his accounts or something. Who knows? Now, Roger's mother reported her concerns to the police, requesting that they do a welfare check on her son. Now, I said, I have an issue with this and I'm really interested in taking your feedback on it. Do you think the police are equipped to handle such delicate matters? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I think based on the most recent, you know, shooting that happened in Lewis and Maine, where there was also a bunch of welfare checks done on that person. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I, I I, I don't know enough, and I think maybe it, it depends on the city and state and locale, but you know what what are they going to do? They're going to come check on the sun and see if he's acting erratically or saying really horrible things or you know showcasing a bunch of weapons. I, I mean, it, it seems like if you are intent on causing destruction and you don't want people to find out about it, it's easy to hide your real motivations, right? And a welfare check. But I, I I don't know. You're right, Asit. But also, are the police knowledgeable? Do they know how to handle or how to identify erratic behavior or red flags? That's what concerns me with police officers, right? I mean, who else would you call, I guess, is the question. Social services? I don't know. Somebody else. I think police shouldn't be making these welfare checks it should be somebody else who really understands, you know, human behavior. Mm. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think that from my perspective, I think my immediate reaction would be to call 911 because I didn't I wouldn't know who else to call. And so I think maybe then that's a question for maybe a therapist, a psychiatrist, a social worker. I, I, I guess for me, like, I don't know how to immediately get a hold of any of those people compared to calling 911. Right. So. I don't disagree mm -hmm. that, yeah, maybe there's there are other people, but like in terms of like being able to get an immediate response from someone for a situation that's happening in the moment, for me, I think maybe this is an argument that you're saying that like nine one one shouldn't be just sending police; they should be sending other people 
along with police or instead of police. But for me, yeah, I guess calling 911 is the right move. Yeah, because in this situation, his parents were concerned about what he was posting on YouTube, right? right. So this was not imminent danger. Nothing bad was happening in that moment. And I wonder if his parents could reach out to his therapist, his psychiatrist or a social worker yeah. and get him evaluated rather than the police who, again, may not be equipped to understand erratic human behavior and changes. Sure. Anyways, coming back to the case, officers did come to the 22-year-old's apartment on April 30th to meet with him. However, upon interviewing Roger, the police found him to be polite and kind, basically finding no reason to believe that he was in any way a danger to himself and others. Mm -hmm. According to the Los Angeles Times, lacking any substantial cause for concern, the officers had no legal right to check his room, which to me is surprising because his mother was concerned they should have checked his room in any case, where they would have found a massive, massive stockpile of weapons. Take a listen to what a retired police officer of the San Diego Police Department had to say about this incident. The Santa Barbara Sheriff's deputies who talked to the suspect in the shooting uh, were not convinced that he was a danger to himself or others. Um, if you look at the video of, of his conversations, um, he seems like a fairly articulate guy, a highly narcissistic guy. So he's able to believe that he can manipulate people in the situations that he comes across. And I think that's may have happened in the situation. With the As the Los Angeles Times explains, it's also worth noting that the police never actually watched Roger's disturbing YouTube videos. Mm. And this may explain why they found his behavior so unconcerning. In addition to his parents, a social worker who worked with Roger also contacted police about his alarming behavior. Oh, right? wow. So a social worker also reached out that to them. That is bam. really a red flag, right? If now two people, parents and the social worker, are calling the police, then yeah, certainly they should have done more in that moment. Uh, wow, that's really interesting, Xavier. And yet, Asad, the police thought he was not a threat and that's what is mind-boggling for me as to how they made that determination yeah I, I mean i think this goes to the imperfection of it all as well and the ability for someone to hide and pretend you know if they are good at that kind of stuff and and in this moment without obviously knowing more it's it's so sad that more wasn't done to get him the help that he needed and prevent the, this crime from happening. So, yeah. So, you know, it's just crazy, sadly, that the signs were there, but still nothing substantial was done, right? Exactly, I said. It feels like this could have been prevented. Sadly, let's take a quick break and when we come back, let's dive into the discussion on Roger's final YouTube video and his manifesto. Welcome back to Invisible Hate. Salia, can you tell us more about Roger's final YouTube video and that manifesto that he wrote? Yes, I said both Elliot Rogers' final video and 137-page manifesto are quite disturbing. So listeners, listen closely. Both sources played a large role in ensuing police investigation of this tragic event, providing officers with Rogers' motivation and allowing them to piece together his story. In the video entitled Elliot Rogers Retribution, the 22-year-old describes his frustrating struggles with rejection and loneliness. Take a listen. Tomorrow is the day of retribution, the day in which I will have my revenge against humanity, against all of you, for the last eight years of my life, ever since I've hit puberty, I've been forced to endure an existence of loneliness, rejection, and unfulfilled desires, all because girls have never been attracted to me. I'm 22 years old, and I'm still a virgin. I've never even kissed a girl. 
I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me, but I will punish you all for it. It's an injustice, a crime, because I don't know what you don't see in me. I'm the perfect guy, the supreme gentleman. You denied me a happy life, and in turn, I will deny all of you life. Roger further expands on these radical thoughts and frustrations in his manifesto called My Twisted World, the story of Elliot Roger. The essay outlines his infuriating experiences, unsatisfied desires, radical thoughts, and general unhappiness. As a whole, the manifesto has a tone of misogynistic, white supremacy. 84 pages into this autobiographical account, Roger describes a situation in which he learns of a black college student who lost his virginity to a blonde white girl. He writes, and I quote, how could an inferior, ugly black boy be able to get a white girl and not me? Oh no. I am beautiful and I am half white myself. I am descended from British aristocracy. He is descended from slaves. I deserve it more. Unquote. Asad, you can tell this kid is extremely disturbed. Yeah, I mean, clearly, I mean, the logic here obviously doesn't make any sense. And he's got the sense of entitlement and clearly white supremacist and misogynistic attitudes and it's sad that this is what he was thinking you know and how how he viewed the world exactly and on page 136 he even outlines an ideal world in which and i quote the first strike against women will be to quarantine all of them in concentration camps at these camps, the vast majority of the female population will be deliberately starved to death. I would take great pleasure and satisfaction in condemning every single woman on earth to starve to death. I would have an enormous tower built just for myself where I can oversee the entire concentration camp and gleefully watch them all die. Unquote. To me, Sadia, clearly he needs a lot of, you know, help mentally. And these are quite extreme views. And I feel like along with his Asperger diagnosis, I mean, obviously I'm not justifying this, but yeah, clearly he needed a lot of help. Yeah, it's just awful. And I just feel like, yeah, clearly he was incredibly troubled. You're absolutely right, Asad. And imagine these are just snippets from 137 right. pages, pages yeah. filled with absurd, radical thoughts. So it's almost hard to believe that there are people out in the world who believe these things. It is really, really terrifying, Asad. But at the same time, my mind goes back to his diagnosis, my mind goes back to how this could have been prevented. So many thoughts right now, Asad, and it just breaks my heart. Yeah, I think it, you know, I think it's it's scary in that, especially, you know, I think it's easy for people that feel the same way like this to find each other in online communities. And in some ways that's good, in some ways it's bad, and that these thoughts, extremist positions become, you know, validated with by other people. And then you know, they feed on each other. And I, I don't know if this is what happened to him, but I'm just, you know, it's, I don't know how he got to this point. It's really scary that, you know, that he has these views, that he couldn't get the help that he needed to realize that they were extreme, hateful, misogynistic, extremist, and, you know, to get the help that he needed. You know, I said sometimes, how do people who have atypical behavior seek help? I don't know if they're even consciously aware that they need help. I think we're both feeling the same way about Rogers. Can you tell us more about the victims of um, this crime? Absolutely, I said. All six victims are believed to have been fellow students at Santa Barbara City College, according to an NBC News broadcast. 
Christopher Michaels Martinez was a sophomore English major with dreams of attending law school. Take a listen to what Christopher's father says in this NBC News interview. This is the most warm, loving, kind hearted you think it asked for. Other victims, Veronica Weiss was a freshman who excelled at math and loved to play sports. Katie Cooper was a senior who loved to dance. She was about to graduate. Roger's first three victims were his very own roommates and their friend. Remember, two of them were his roommates. And it's hard to understand why he would unleash such a horrendous act of violence against the very people he lived with. But I said we can safely assume that he must have seen them as part of the problem. And I'm saying problem in quotes, yeah, right? Yeah, totally, yeah. Perhaps the two young men had girlfriends, inciting jealousy, or perhaps he merely didn't get along with them. Right. Who knows? For sure. According to the New York Times article, Roger once reported one of his roommates to police claiming he had stolen three candles with a value of $22. So perhaps tensions were high even mm -hmm. then. Yeah. But regardless of the specific reason for these particular killings, it's clear that Roger ultimately ended up taking his rage out on the entire community, seeking to shoot anyone and everyone. And this is something we've talked about in the beginning as well, right? Totally. Thankfully, all 14 of those whom Roger injured were able to recover, though many of them spent a substantial period of time in the trauma center of the Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. Yeah, I mean, that's always great to hear that the people that were injured recovered. Obviously, they're going to be dealing with the mental scars for this for the rest of their lives. And I imagine, Sally, that this had a huge impact on the families and the community as well, right? Absolutely, Asad. The community was devastated. Following the shooting, many members of the community gathered for a candlelight vigil in order to honor the memories of those killed in the rampage. Beyond the community itself, this tragic incident reignited the contentious national debate on gun control. Now, for our listeners, according to The Guardian, California has some of the strongest gun control laws in the nation. And yet, Roger was able to legally purchase and possess three handguns and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, despite a history of mental health concerns by his family. Yeah, I mean, I'm not under the myth of gun control laws preventing someone who really wants to find and purchase a gun, prevent them from doing that. I mean, it just, it's a fallacy at this point. Like if you are intent on buying a gun and finding a gun, I'm sure that there are very easy ways. I've never done it, but I'm sure that there are very easy ways of getting your hands on a gun, both legally and illegally. Exactly. And I said, this violent rampage held far more dangerous implications than national debate. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, Roger's attack is recognized, and I quote, as the pivotal moment where misogynist incels coalesced as a movement distinct from other male supremacist online communities. Oh, fascinating. So this was kind of the beginning. This was the beginning. In other words, the attack gave the incel movement momentum. Wow. As BBC News explains, Roger has been, and I quote, virtually canonized, unquote, by many French communities. Wow. Online. Fascinating. Yeah. As a result, the 2014 Isla Vista attacks have inspired further acts of violence in the name of involuntary celibate men. This includes a man who intentionally drove his car into two girls, as well as two men who threatened mass violence. In the years since the 2014 attack, more than 100 people have been killed or injured in the name of this extremist ideology. 
Asad, it's so difficult to keep track of how many extremist ideologies <laughs> That's a lot that exist we talk about. out there. I know, right? We could make a list of extremist ideologies that we've learned about or read on through our podcast. Yeah, I mean, there'd be so many and we'd be adding to it every week. And yeah, you know, I think, sadly, this is just, just really scary. I can't believe that this was the start of it. Yeah, this was 2014. And, you know, I think that's probably around the time where I started to hear about this word incel or whatever. But yeah, that's it's just super scary. I think this is probably a good time to transition to our main question. So should this killing be considered a hate crime? What do you think? So I said in analyzing the set of victims killed by these attacks... Roger's violent acts appear to be random at times, right? Committed against the community as a whole, um, which may not be suggestive of a hate crime. But when you look closely, when you look at his final YouTube video and his 137-page manifesto, it's pretty clear that this was very much an attack on women, right? Yeah, a punishment no against the female species for all the rejection that Roger had faced in his lifetime. And we know he says things like, and I quote, I cannot kill every single female on earth, but I can deliver a devastating blow that will shake all of them to the core of their wicked hearts, mm. unquote. Wow. What do you think? You know, I think clearly his manifesto, I mean, it's a reason it's called the manifesto. Right? It's a, right. uh, It was misogynistic. It was uh, white supremacist. It was just so many of those words, right? Clearly, he was targeting people because of maybe not all the victims were female, but like on his way to creating the carnage, he wanted to target women and he wanted to cause destruction as for as many women as possible. And so I think, yeah, this totally for me was was and should have been categorized as a hate crime. You're absolutely right, I said. And then we'll bring in his atypical behavior and how there were red flags and how I wish people could see that. His mom did, but others could see that too and get him the help that he needed. Then not everybody who exhibits that kind of behavior, engages in such horrific, horrendous acts of violence. Totally, yeah. I think for me, the uh, the message that I just want to get across is that for anybody who's feeling this way, that's young, that's a male and, you know, incel or whatever, it's like it, it gets better. This is just maybe a phase that you're going through in life and you will meet someone. If you put yourself out there enough, you will find someone that you can share a life with. And it's sad that Roger couldn't see that future for himself. Yeah, exactly. So Sadia, where are the surviving victims today? I said, unfortunately, we don't have any specific information regarding the whereabouts of Roger's surviving victims today. We can only hope that they've managed to move past this traumatic event, going on to lead happy and healthy lives in whatever form or shape that manifests, right? As for the family members of those who did not survive, again, our hearts are with them as they continue to heal from the pain and grief of this tragic event. Yeah, that's right. Sadie, what can listeners do to help? I said listeners can help by donating to nonprofit organizations such as Women for Women, that seek to put an end to gender-based violence and support survivors of such violence. Listeners can also donate to the Southern Poverty Law Center as means of supporting their work against male supremacy. Thanks again for listening to Invisible Hate. If you want to learn more, check out links in the show notes about the case Please email us your thoughts on this story or any other story that you think we should cover. You can reach us at info at invisiblehatepodcast.com. You can also tweet us or hit us up on Instagram. Just search for Invisible Hate Podcast. By the way, 
Next week is Thanksgiving. We are still debating whether we'll release a new episode <laughs> or we will come back the following week. So stay tuned. Check out our social media for more information on that. Yeah. And yeah, thanks again for listening. If you like what you hear, please share with a friend. Invisible Hate is a joint production between Immigrantly and Riffelion Media. We'd like to thank our team, which includes Michaela Strather, Emmanuel Monahan, and Purama Chakravarti. Our music was done by Simon Hutchinson. And yeah, we'll be back in a week or two with another hate crime for us to analyze. Until then, I'm Asad Butt. And I'm Sadia Khan. Take care. Take care.